truth. Television is a goddamn amusement park. Television is a circus, a carnival, a traveling troupe of acrobats, storytellers, dancers, singers, jugglers, sideshow freaks, lion tamers, and football players. We're in the boredom killing business. So turn off your television sets, turn them off now. Welcome to TLV TV. Today on Eradicating Programmed Ignorance, we have a special surprise for you. But, of course, for us specialists, anything but normal. Um, we will be combining our one-hour segment with an hour of Randy Morgan's Off-Planet TV show, which follows our show immediately, to bring you a two-hour special um, titled... Uh, what used to be unthinkable is now normal, ending the silence. Now, a little bit about Randy for anybody who's been hiding under a rock and doesn't know who Randy Moggins is. Randy is no stranger to media, having been around the game for well over a decade. I won't embarrass him by telling you exactly how much more than a decade, but we'll say a decade spices. Besides being the founder and facilitator of Off-Planet Radio and TV, Randy is also very involved in uh, setting up the media aspects of the Liberty Beacon Project. And for that, we can never repay him, although he'll probably try and make us. <laughs> anyway, Randy is a good friend. Randy is a great source of good information. And Randy is um, somebody to have on your team when you're going after people who have just perpetrated so much tyranny not only the American people, but the people of the world, that most people don't even understand it anymore. Okay? So, this is Randy, all right? And anybody who doesn't know Randy, one more thing I want to tell you, okay? The reason why I enjoy doing these type of conversations with Randy is I can have an intelligent conversation without expecting a freak out or to due to my general propensity for political incorrectness. Something <clears throat> I was born before the advent of and still have no place for in my life in my life at all. Okay, so from the massive political and economic shenanigans being perpetrated on an ever increasing pace to the constantly expanding deficit of our moral character. We as a society display more daily America, and as a result, pretty much the entire world is upside down, inside out, topsy-turvy, and ass backwards today. And we're going to discuss that. Because what you have here between Randy and myself is well over a century, and yes, I actually said that, well over a century of living time. We're going to talk about perspectives that most of you maybe don't have a clue about because you weren't alive then, and you only have to go on with the government, the textbooks, and those we would classify as sheep will have to tell you today, which basically means you're ignorant. Growing up in the late 1950s and the early 1960s was a different experience. It required a different mindset, different rules and scruples that today seem as foreign as their lack would have seemed a short three generations ago. If you truly look at the transformation of America over the past several generations, then you have no choice but to see one pillar of that society after another torn asunder without so much as a weekend protest march to highlight its destruction. Yes, we the people. Too much to be bothered. War and over reaching government, okay, was protested by millions for participation in one war, what was being called a police action. Protesters were jailed and maybe even killed, remember Kent State, but continued to turn out in vast numbers to bend and overreaching government to their will, the will of the people. And in many small cases and some large cases, they even had successes. 
That was the normal reaction or action then. And now the game is totally different. So drastically change in venue and goal that one would have to be told this is in fact the same game to understand that at all. Today, there is an American military presence either overtly or covertly in about 170 out of 196 nations on this planet. While tens of millions, and I said that, of Americans walk the streets homeless or hungry and too big a portion of that number today is our vulnerable children. This is not a guess. Everything I speak is fact, and I never challenge you to prove me wrong. I, in fact, always dare you to prove what I'm saying is wrong. The military aspect is only one of the major changes we will be tearing into in this two-hour special. The political, moral, economic, medical, legal, technological, ecological, biological, educational, etc. pillars are all in as bad a shape or worse as those we've already discussed and suffer from the same lack of attention or involvement. Today, a majority of Americans represent a society that is so successfully dumbed down that they can no longer even recognize the same moral failings that had us enraged and active not so long ago concerning these same issues. When that used to be normal, it is now all upside down. And how are you today, Randy? I really can't wait for you to wade into this. Hey, Roger. Uh, I'm doing great. Sorry, we had some tech problems early on, so we jumped out, rebooted all the systems and came back in. Gosh, what's new? I mean, ah, perfect timing. My God, I just now passed this over to you. And I, I was looking over my notes, so I couldn't even see your picture. I didn't know you were gone. <laughs> yeah, I seem to be dogged by tech these days. I was on um, our friend Chuck O'Shelley's show last week, and uh, lo and behold, Skype would not let me go in on their network. So um, it's a myriad of problems that we're dealing with. Isn't it great? We're so technologically advanced in this country, and yet, well, we're being blocked by the technology that's supposed to enable us to do this. Oh, what a surprise. Well, technology is always a two-edged sword, all right? It is. And remember, with 30 years, oh, actually over 30 years if you count everything, working either directly or indirectly for the military via the military-industrial complex, what I look at is everything we get in new technology, <clears throat> whether it's cell phones, whether it was satellite phones, whether it was flat screen, so on and so forth. <laughs> By the time you and I get it, it's not only because they've got something better they can move on to, and this can become technology for you and I, but it's also been readied for you and I. It allows them the ability to look and see, the ability to listen in, the ability to switch on, oh, gee, the camera on your computer without you even knowing it. Okay, yeah. it allows your cable box, and most people don't understand this, to record you and literally see you within a small frame of reference. It allows all of these things to happen. So technology, yes, you're absolutely right, Randy. It is a two-edged sword. Um, it would be hoped that individuals like you and I that spent our entire life tethered to this thing we call technology would be a little bit more adept at covering our own asses than most people are. <laughs> Well, we live in the panopticon. We are in a society of 24-7 surveillance. Um, everything that we do is monitored, assessed, processed, and then filed and used theoretically against us in a jury before people not our peers because the America that we live in now is a police state. Um, and, and all of that, the shunning light has in some ways been the technology that is allowing us to do this now, albeit doing it sometimes hobbled either by the technology itself or by the lack of finances or by the lack of um, support, both materially and cognitively by the listeners. But we always hope that our listeners, and I believe they are, that exceptional group. <laughs> yes. 
that understands what, what we have to do to get this out and why this is so difficult. This, by the way, is why this is the first time I've done a show, I think, in two months. Yeah. Network. Um, I basically took my leave for a while and I assessed the landscape because I had become convinced that what we were doing didn't matter. You know, it's funny when you step back from something long enough, you get a clear perspective on it and people begin to reach out and they let you know that what you do is important. And, and that's gratifying. It's not an ego stroke. It is simply a way of saying that in some small way, what I do, what you do, what uh, a whole host of other hosts do out there is important and that we need to keep pressing at this to not give up and become discouraged. Well, and see, you, you, you segue so perfectly into things that I wish to say <clears throat> that it makes it just almost <clears throat> faultless. What, what, you know, we're sitting here today with a society that has hinged, literally hinged to everything that comes out um, on the mainstream news. And we're talking about a majority of America, but – Nowhere near as big a majority as if you and I were having this discussion even a year ago, and we'll get into that. But let's say a lot of Americans <clears throat> are hinged on the <clears throat> media today because we're in an election season, okay? <clears throat> we're about to send somebody to Washington for another two years, for another four years, for another six years. We're about to send somebody, somebody's to Washington, and – um we know because the television told us that this guy has a beautiful family with beautiful kids who are all above average intelligence. They have no vaccine damage. They have no GMO damage. They have no fluoride damage. Um, they, you know, uh, they're, they're athletic looking. They're gorgeous. When they smile, they blind you. And these are perfect people. So a vast majority of America is about to make the same freaking mistake they have made over and over and over again since the middle 1800s when the United States was sold right out from the American people without us even realizing it. Yeah, Most we'll, people will tell you that people didn't even understand the United States was no longer a republic until after the turn of the 20th century. And those that did – well, basically, there were enough lies in place for them to make them look like idiots. Do we call them tinfoil hat wearers today? Yes, you were going to say something. Please, I have an idea what you're going to say, and I'd really like you to plug it in. Well, the, basically, we're looking at the political myopia that was installed in the American program long ago to believe that the office of what we call the U.S. president is singularly the most important office and that we somehow magically have this power to – Pick up this leader through our populist voting mechanism and that we actually make a meaningful difference in a mechanism we call democracy, which is something we were never given in our organic constitutional system. No. And that it has, in essence, become this, this cult of personality that arises around figures who have been selected in the background by a very elite group of people who make or break both presidents and kings around the planet. Uh, this, this, this leader, this leader, whoever it may be, and I have to stress, because at least on one side of the political aisle right now, we don't know what this being is. I have a pretty good idea. So but, do I. Um, we have what appears to be two candidates right now, both of whom are um, – now I'm going to vie for our attention over the next, oh, God, what is this? This is May. We've got till November, so do the math. We've got seven or eight months of politics that's just going to be a media feeding frenzy. It already has been. And somehow we believe that we are agents in all of this, that we're making this happen. Um, <laughs> But, but we are. <clears throat> we are. 
<laughs> we 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 are. We live in a constitutional republic. <laughs> All of our rights and freedoms are solid and in place. Our kids are being taught the actual history of the United States. All right. Obviously, neither you nor anybody else listening to this is believing a word I'm saying. All right. Let me give you a quick rundown on what needs to be changed, because if we continue, okay, just haphazardly and just blindly to follow the leader here. And every time he stops, we get our nose buried so far up his butt we can't b- breathe anymore. These, this is a short list of the things that need to be changed that we valued as an American society in the 1950s when you and I were brought into this world and started to grow up. The system of education, <clears throat> shot, got to be replaced. The system of national health, shot, got to be replaced, okay? The system of health checks and balances, CDC, um, FDA, EPA, shot. So corrupt, it's insane, got to be replaced, okay? Economic system, um, long since quit being um, a system whereby money was open and free and what was supposedly illegal in this country, which is monopolies, is all that we have today. Those with the biggest bucks who can buy the most leaders have the most privileges. Roger, so the economic Roger, system, yes. You haven't named a single function there. That's constitutionally ordained by government. Oh, I understand. That's that, that's where I was going with all of this, <clears throat> because I was going to name the military. I was going to name, uh, which is controlled by in a dictatorial fashion, constitution never, ever intended. OK, and <clears throat> if you go right down the line, what we're looking at is none of this is constitutionally ordained. None of it. As a matter of fact, you've heard me mention before, and some of you might have heard me mention this on other shows, about <clears throat> the second year old, a second grade student who brought homework home, and her mother said, Let me take a look at that. And she started to read through it, and it was a social studies lesson whereby the student was being informed that the US federal government grants them privileges as rights as a benevolent government. Let me explain something to everybody listening here. What you can give it, you can take it away. So now your children, not only is the big lie being told, but the biggest lie is being told. None of the unalienable or inalienable, they're both right, believe it or not, rights that you and I were granted by our creator in any shape or form you believe that entity exists are now being claimed as the government's privileges. The right of a government to grant you privileges. That, my friends, is so close to tyranny. The only thing separating it is the capital T. And you say, Randy? (laughs) Where to begin with that? (laughs) First off, off, um, I remember growing up and taking a driver's education course in my state-sponsored school, and they told me, Driving is a privilege. Yes. Well, guess what? They were right. Driving is the privilege. It's a licensed privilege because you operate under commerce. Commerce. Now you go into semantics and color of law. And the color of law says driving, the thing that you get a license for, is something that the state gives you a right to do. However, traveling by any means of conveyance possible was constitutionally guaranteed to us as a natural given right. <clears throat> not a right even given by the government, not even assured by the Constitution. It was an inherent right of being a human. Human the being. Land. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold, hold, hold on a second. Are you telling me it's not constitutional for them to put you on a no-fly list so that you... You know, you've got a family emergency. You get everything packed up. You're going nuts. You get to the airport. Somebody looks at you and says, "Uh uh-uh, you're on a no-fly list. You ain't getting on no plane in this country. And all of a sudden, your entire world crashes down around you. You mean that kind of right to travel? Yeah. Okay, well, Well, gee, I guess that's unconstitutional then, isn't it? 
you see, we're willfully ignorant of some things. <laughs> and, 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 and we're actually, we're willfully, I mean, I'm still willfully ignorant. I am not this fountainhead. Of I don't think you're willfully ignorant. I think what? that you are ignorant of things, but not willful. I travel enough <laughs> to know at this point that when I walk into an air, airport, I am on a federal zone. Because the U.S. government incorporated for profit, look at look it up on Dun and Bradstreet, look it up on any of the places that list corporate corporate lists. Mana is another website you can look at. The U.S. government has appropriated for itself all of the airports that that are are not privately owned, not small aircraft airports, under the auspices of the FAA under the auspices of the same kind of activity we saw in Oregon, the BLM taking, making their land grabs, the government has reached out and appropriated everything unto itself. And we have stood by and shook our heads and went, yup, yup, that's <laughs> yep. here's my papers. Here's my papers. Uh, can I punch my card now? Can I go, please? <laughs> And that's the dumb, stupid Americans that sat on their asses while freedom died in this country. Okay. Let's tell you what you don't have. We're done. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Let's tell you. Actually, I was going to say, let me tell you what you still have, but I didn't feel we could fill up enough time with that because there ain't a hell of a lot there on that list. Let's talk about what we don't have, okay? We don't have peace of mind. We don't have a lack of fear. We don't have economic security. We don't have educational security. We don't have economic security. We don't have health security. We don't have, all right, okay, anybody out there? You probably already realized what I just said is everything you think you have today, you're wrong. You're wrong. Because if you think you have economic security, Okay, then you tell me why Princeton, in conjunction with several other high, highly valued um, uh, universities, published a paper whereby they state that <clears throat> when everything is taken into consideration, the United States can no longer be said to be ruled in a democratic fashion. It can no longer be said so, that we are in fact ruled in an oligarchical fashion. Whoa, this, Randy, this is Princeton, you know, this is Princeton. We're not talking about, you know, the local community college in Schenectady, New York, you know, we're, we're talking about, or, or some, you know, pay me 99.95 over the internet and I'll give you a college degree. This is Princeton. And they're saying you and I can no longer lay claims to living in a constitutional republic which was ruled in a democratic fashion. Not a democracy. A democracy, as you started to allude to a little bit earlier, democracy is mob rule, where 50.00001% can rule 49.99999% absolutely, and there isn't a damn thing that 49 0.999% can do. So we're looking at a government today that is not only don't we live in a constitutional republic, but we've got one of our one of our biggest scholarly institutions in this country, if not the planet, stating we live in an oligarchy. Randy, I know what an oligarchy is. What does it mean to you? Because there are people out there going, well, a prince has said it. It can't be that bad. Come on. What is an oligarchy, Randy? Well, it is ruled by elitism. It's ruled by a central core of people who either by birthright or by dint of some nobility, some function of titles, that's very important, have said they are the end all be all of humanity. They are the ones who have the power to decide and that they are basically better than the rest of us. <laughs> and who better to do that than Princeton, of course, because when they're not laying in coffins naked, telling each other their sexual fantasies and jerking off, that's what they're doing. 
A, they are Mr. Bush's, George and George W. Isn't that what you do at Princeton and Yale, <laughs> all these other places? I mean, let's face it. These are, the, these are the most perverse, dark, sick, twisted people on the planet. In fact, some, some of us refer to them as reptilians, and not without good reason, because quite frankly, the only thing they're controlled by is that part of their brain that only knows death and survival. At all costs. At all costs. And for anybody who thinks that, you know, I'm, I'm jumping on the last two generations um, since, since I came around, because I'm, I'm, the, I'm the baby boomers generation. I'm, I, I grew up in the 50s and the 60s. <clears throat> then there's the 70s and the 80s. Then there's the 90s and, and, the, and the early 20, uh, 21st century. So, you know, I'm, I, I'm basically looking back and stating that so much has changed over the last three generations that I don't even recognize the world I live in today. Um, Princeton states unequivocally, quit lying to our children. That's not what they say, but that's what it boils down to. Quit telling our children they live in a constitutional republic. That's insane. It doesn't happen that way, okay? The United States is ruled by a itty bitty little piece of land that is so insignificant on the map you couldn't even see it unless you really focus down in with them satellites and that is 10 miles square plot of land called washington dc washington dc is thereby directed by those individuals that randy so eloquently spoke to these elitists the banksters who own the global financial system Warfare, even warfare, Randy, when you and I were young, and I don't ever want to put a good spin on warfare, so please don't take it this way. At least war was war, okay? We wanted to shoot people because we didn't like what the hell they were doing, and we went in and shot them. Today, what do we have for war? What do we have for war when we knew Four years prior to ever invading a single country in the Middle East that the United States had plans to go into five nations at the turn of the 21st century, invade them, occupy them, and take over not only their resources but institute a Federal Reserve-style bank. Gee, does it surprise anybody to know that that's Syria, that that's Libya, that that's Afghanistan, that that's Iran, that that's, you know, let, let's go on, you know, where we been? That's Iraq. That's Sudan. Okay. There were seven countries prior to world, um, excuse me, to uh, prior to 9-11, which did not still still didn't have a central bank on this planet immediately following 9-11 and the attacks of these five countries either overtly or covertly there are now three nations left that don't have a central bank that's cuba iran and and, um uh north korea but who has one now all right well you can bet afghanistan does yep Well, you can bet Libya does. Well, you can bet the Sudan does. Well, you can bet that Iraq does. In other words, wherever we went in, what we took away was the life's blood of the people, what they needed to survive in their own sovereign territory, and every penny we could rape the nation of and walked away. Am I far off from that, Randy? No, not at all. And, and in fact, history, history actually bears that out. I mean, the, 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 the rulers of this planet for thousands of years have been the same class of people, even in some cases the same bloodlines, that rule today. What a surprise that it looks like, where did I see this, uh, uh, a student, uh, like a seventh grade student, studied the bloodlines of U.S. presidents and discovered that maybe... Yep. Five were related to European nobility. Gee, the nut doesn't fall far from the tree, does it? No. Here we are in the 21st century, thinking we're free, being ruled by the same bloodlines that have sat roughshod over this human race 
for maybe upwards of 10,000 years. Well, changed. jump back to Rome. And let's take a look at a republic in its in its golden years and then waning, okay? In its golden years, they had um, conquered many, many um, territories, many lands across the planet. They had used their military might to enforce their will. They have drawn, had drawn tribute. They had uh, those who were the elite had gained vast power and vast wealth. Okay. And then it started to crumble from within because when a, a government is left unto its own devices, it shall eventually accumulate power and wealth unto itself. This is inevitable. It's not a guess. We saw Rome crumble. What we are looking at today is the crumbling of Rome happening all over again. When you and I were young, Randy, we were lucky enough to live in a nation <clears throat> that boasted the biggest, even though we were still being lied to then, we still boasted the biggest middle class the planet had ever seen. The massive amount of in immigration into this country was not so much because we had a lot of land, although that was a secondary reason and the primary secondary reason. The main reason was, okay, the freedom of individuals in this country to determine their own futures. This is this was the middle class. I can be whatever I want. I can do whatever I want. I can raise my stature in life without having to petition an elite, a king, a queen, an earl, whoever rules me to allow me to boost my status. That was the biggest reason for immigration into this country. And today, who in their right freaking mind wants to come and live in America? And I'm sure you found upon that, Randy, because if you can't, I will. <laughs> no, we're just busting them in now. Um, it <laughs> yeah. to me like um, the incentive to come to America has to do with welfare benefits and uh, the opportunity to partake of the uh, final chunk <laughs> of meat off of the eagle that's been carved up. The um, There's no incentive. There's no European migration into America anymore. The productive working class in this country has nowhere to go. Why would why would uh, productive people want to come here? Yes, they come here in visas and, and green cards because we still need computer programmers. And yes, they're coming across the border because as bad as it is here, it's a hell of a lot better than Mexico and apparently a hell of a lot better than it is in Syria. But the United States in terms of being the Footpath to liberty and prosperity, that's long been eclipsed. That happened on our watch in our lifetime. Well, if you if you all want to take a look at some sobering facts, um, <clears throat> there is – just go to Google or go to Bing and type in um, America in, is number one at. What you're going to end up with <clears throat> is a lot of articles and a lot of information. What you're also going to find out is that we're – just about the best at um, political correctness. We're just about the best at, um, I don't know, lying and um, um, brainwashing a population. We're just about the best at destroying the health of an entire society. We're just about the best at, and we do these things very well. Randy, when you and I were born three generations ago, we were born into the healthiest society on the planet. My God, we were a healthy bunch of people. I grew up, and this is when I was a kid out playing on the playgrounds and, 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 and running through the woods with sticks and stones and, and, and doing these things. I grew up, I don't remember another kid with allergies. Anything worse than hay fever. I don't remember autoimmune dysfunctions. I don't remember autism. I only remember knowing one child who was considered to be on the retar uh, 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 retarded is what, basically what it was called, a retarded child, a mentally impaired child. One in my entire life. <clears throat> Today, over 70% of American children suffer either something from a minor all the way through to a major or life-afflicting um, 
scenario, whether it is food allergies, which can be deadly, whether it is somewhere on the autism spectrum, whether it is autoimmune dysfunctions, whether it is cognitive dysfunctions, whether it is – we're talking about 70 percent of our generate this generation, the newest generation, will grow up not only without liberty, but they will grow up without health. This is the first generation – Scientists are boldly going where none have gone before and stating this is the first generation whereby their parents will outlive them. The parents' longevity will exceed their children's. What did I just say, Randy? My God, did you ever think you would hear that in your lifetime ever? Natural outcome. It's an, it, well, it's a natural outcome of the course that we've been on. The seeds were sown in our generation. We already were getting the vaccines then. I distinctly remember going to a public school and taking the Sabin polio vaccine. I distinctly remember receiving all these MMR-type vaccines that they're giving children now. The difference is they hadn't thoroughly <laughs> weaponized them yet. We were only then beginning to go into socialized medicine. It was going to take another 40 years to do that. The FDA, the EPA, and all the alphabet agencies were still building up their armies of bureaucrats fat on the budgets that had come as a result of the National Security Act in 1947, which created an entire wing of government that did not exist before World War II. All of these programs that began to roll out required the political will of the people, either by express consent, or by doing what we're now going to blindly do again, which is go vote for some empty suit or some empty girdle to lead <laughs> us into the next wing of the decline of the American public republic. Well, I got I, I to tell you, you know, one of the things that hurts me uh, and, and, and literally <laughs> rings my charm harder than anything else, and I know you're aware of this, Randy, and so many other people are, is the vaccine issue. I do understand. I have seen I have seen this. I have done interviews with Dr. Nagari from Kenya where him and the doctors are their scientists and they have analyzed the uh, vaccines that were used by the WHO in Kenya on three different occasions and have been responsible for sterilizing between eight and 10 million Kenyan women against their knowledge and against their permission. Okay. This is just the WHO saying, Hey, we got too many people here. Um, when we look at what happened in America, we have so many people out there thinking right now, and that's what this show is for people. I'm going to pop your bubble. Okay. That kind of crap can't happen in America. <clears throat> Randy just talked about the polio vaccine. Let me explain something to you. The CDC stated at one point, because I have screenshots of it, that as many as 30 million Americans could be at risk of cancer because the polio vaccine that they were, they were <coughs> administered had a known component of the SB40 virus in it. Well, let me tell you the crap there, my friends, because it was 90 million and I, with as many as 110 million Americans receiving that vaccine. And some of them, a good portion of them, getting multiple doses of that vaccine. So in 1963, the CDC took, made sure that the SB40 virus was out of that um, polio vaccine so that not too many people would be at risk anymore. What they're not telling anybody was they discovered it there. In early 2000, I'm, I'm um, 1960. Now let's do some math here, and there ought to be a smile spreading across some of your faces. It was detected in early 1960. We were told in 1963 it had been removed from this polio vaccine. How many Americans in the biggest polio scare in the history of this country were being pushed? and herded into huge lines to get a polio vaccine, which they knew, knew was contaminated for three years with the HP40 vac uh, um, uh, 
virus. Not only that, but there is proof. Please Google this. There is research stating that the SV40 virus could have, could have, okay, um, populated some of the vaccines as late as the year 2000. That doesn't sound like 2000 or 1963 to me. So they knew it was there in 1960. They said they took it out in 1963, which means 110 million Americans, the baby boomers, got this at least once, maybe twice. Okay, a booster. The biggest demographic in this country today with cancer are the baby boomers with one in three either having died from or already having been diagnosed with cancer. One in three. We're the ones who got that vaccine. So anybody who thinks that any of this is a plan that started yesterday, let me explain something to you without expanding this show way too much further because we would have to. This plan started over 500 years ago. What you're seeing is the end game. And why? Because of all the pretty little technology that has allowed them to speed up the scenario. And here's where I would like you to jump in, Randy, because your face is starting to contort. You must have things to say. Technology. Are you there? Yeah, yeah. The, well, we think this all began yesterday. Um, well, most maybe, people maybe, want to believe that. M- what most people don't understand is that even yeah. the Black Plague in Europe was a planned yes. plague. We waged biological genocide on the North American continent in the early 1700s against the natives here using blankets. smallpox. This is not smallpox new. blankets. Yeah, smallpox blankets. Yeah. yeah. Biological warfare is an essential part of the armamentarian against the populace waged by these same elitists. Now, it's not lost on me that here we are, the baby boomer generation, the largest offspring group ever to grace the planet in recorded modern history, a result of a war where soldiers came back to a climate of relative prosperity and relative security or the illusion of same. And this generation was born in the era of the New Deal, Social Security, everything that FDR gave us. And it was well understood because, let's face it, at the end of the day, the government knows how to run actuarial tables. They knew they had a problem. They knew that this generation was going to pay for the retirement of the two previous generations, but they also saw something else, the drop-off that was occurring in the population. Knowing full well that and running deficit budgets under Keynesian economics, this generation was the one that had to take the shaft for this. And so there was a long-range program to make sure we didn't live too long because there isn't enough money for us to collect that social security check at the end of the rainbow. Well, let me see. We were pre-programmed or scenarios were put into place to keep us from living too long for two reasons. The first one is the economic, which you obviously mentioned. And the second one is that most people don't consider is we are unique on this planet, as the largest demographic in this country, we also have three generations of perspective. We know that that damn textbook is lying to our children. We know what's being said on the TV is a big freaking lie. We know that this doctor telling us that we need to take this medication because we're having trouble sleeping. And the side effect of this medication is I may want to put a gun in my mouth and swallow a few bullets. We know these things. Okay. This is the state of medicine today. Anything that you can buy or anything you, you're supposed to recommend to your doctor, recommend this to your doctor next time you go there. Okay. And then they go through the real fast side effects, which include, you know, things like um, may increase thoughts of suicide, may cause sudden heart failure, may cause Jesus, all I couldn't do was sleep. And now I'm going to go take something that's probably going to kill me every which way, but loose. But guess what? I'm going to get a good night's sleep. 
This is the world we live in today, Randy. Okay? Nobody stops to think about what's causing the problems. All people want to do is cure the symptoms. And we have been taught that if we can alleviate the symptoms, the problems won't bother us and we become customers for life. And that is what we are today. That biggest demographic in this country today, the baby boomers, all right, we are sitting in a catbird seat right now because we know more than anybody else about what's the truth and what's a lie because we actually saw it change. And two, we're sitting here watching a country that's about to implode. Now, you brought up a point I want to tie in. We have the highest level of Alzheimer's on the planet. The highest level of dementia on the planet. The highest level of auto, uh, uh, um, excuse me, autism on the planet. The highest level of ADHD on the planet. Need I keep going? All right. If you think that this can change, and that has changed in the last two generations, in 40 years, we can go from the most vibrant, healthiest society on the entire planet to the sickest, chronically sickest society on the planet in 40 years without a little bit of help, without a little bit of steerage, without a little bit pushing the cart behind us to make sure we actually make some headway. You're a freaking idiot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's the truth. All right. You, you muted yourself. I can see your lips moving. There you go. Yeah, I know. I know. I do this. Um, the analogy right. of ignoring the symptoms is actually what we're talking about. We, oh, God. We, now that, we have ignored the symptoms. Yes. We, have, we have ignored the symptoms of a sick culture. Because ultimately, all of these problems stem from what I consider to be two key areas. They're not the only ones. They are the most critical. They are spiritual and moral issues um our generation was seeded with propaganda that made us believe we were indestructible that we were not accountable morally for the things that we did that we we could indulge in endless pleasure on an endless pool of credit cards owning anything we want consuming anything we want smoking anything we want having sex with anything we want and never pay the price now I'm not a prude. I'm not a moralist in the sense of preaching this. What I'm saying is nature provides us with the example of the results of our consequences. We make choices. We make choices individually. We make them collectively. As a culture, as a generation, we made horrible choices because we ignored the obvious. Growing up in the 60s, looking at what happened in the streets of this country, And then not looking behind the scenes to realize that, yes, all of it was planted and seeded as an illusion. The revolution that supposedly happened in the 60s was a joke. Jerry Rubin, one of the leaders of the Chicago 8, went off to make a damn nice living on Wall Street. He was part of the greed is good generation played by Michael Douglas in the movie Wall Street. We did not grow up with our ideals of egalitarianism and charity and generosity and peace, love, brother. No, we grew up in a generation of greed. And now we're reaping that greed. And so as as we come to the nexus of this generation, the only thing we can do right now is look back with regret and then damn quickly try to repair the damage that we've done. The biggest issue when we talk about repairing damage, the biggest issue is the credibility we have lost with our children. Because when we have to go to our children and say, I've known this for a long time, but you know, you believe this, 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 and this, and it's all a lie. And this is what the facts are. We right now, we already suffer. Okay, due to the reputation um, we have presented, be ourselves to our children. If 
and when we decide, and this is something I know you believe has to be done first above anything else, the truth needs to be told. We are going to take a huge burden as that generation who knows three generations of perspective. We know three generations of perspective. So we have allowed – we didn't drag them kicking and screaming, our children and our grandchildren to cross over into a political and economic situation that we never would have tolerated as children. It would have been the thing of horror stories. It would have been a science fiction novel. Yet this is reality for our children today. What do you think is going to happen when we go to our children and our children's children and start to tell them the honest to God truth? Do you think they'll even listen, Randy? I'd like to think some of us are. I'd like to think I have. You know, in a sense, Roger, that's what drives this whole thing that we do. That's why you're compelled to work the God awful long hours that you do to put out the Liberty Beacon why I have for 10 years now scraped along doing these shows. This is live on the air, truth and reconciliation, putting the facts on the table, being accountable. This is the example we need to present to everybody out there, uh, not just in the United States, around the world. We are accountable. And the way we deal with that is we become transparent. <clears throat> Pardon me. We unify our efforts, and we don't look back with regret. We look forward with the hope that what we put out now are the seeds for a better future for the rest of the planet. Well, you're lo- we're looking at a situation here and now where, um, again, the first thing we need to do is we need to let the baby boom- boomers know that they d- all don't have to die uh, prematurely. They all don't have to wither away with Alzheimer's, wither wither away with dementia. They all don't have to be dying from cancer. They all don't have to. And that there are, there are other avenues they can travel down. And this was the intent of the Toxic Solutions Project, which we launched. And this is to let you baby boomers know and understand that you've still got 20, 30, 40 years in front of you. You really do, but the deck is stacked against you. The air you're breathing, the medication you're taking, the food you're eating, the water you're drinking, it's all programming, and it ain't good for you. So what you need to do is wake up to the fact that the truth ain't going to help you one damn bit of good if you ain't going to live long enough to do something with it. So give a damn about your health first. Then – then you can focus down on what can I do to convince people things ain't what they are being told they are. The first thing you need to do is be around long enough to convince somebody. Would you agree, Randy? Let's get ourselves back on some sort of a healthy or a semi-healthy track, and then let's go for the gusto. That's absolutely true. Um, The things that we're doing right now in the background are designed to enable people to remedy health problems, to have a healthier lifestyle and in every respect to do that. We have to be able to live long enough to do this and we have to have vibrant lives. We are okay. So we were the me generation, but what did we do? You know, we didn't take very good care of me either. So now we got to fix that. And that's one aspect of it. The other side of it is, and we'll talk about this when we move over on the next hour to my show. Yep. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about accountability, but we're going to talk about the good side of it because there are things we can do and we can unify. We can pull people together, but we also have to be willing to suffer the indignity of humbling ourselves and working with other people <sighs> and being honest. I, I totally agree with you. I, I do. And and for anybody who doesn't feel that um, it's time to start listening, um, and <laughs> there's only going to be two types of racers in this in, in, in this sprint, those who make it and those who don't. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, um, yeah, I, I understand we're moving over to your show now, so we're going to take a few minutes break. We are. Randy, the conversation is always sterling with you. I'm just sad that we don't do it more often, my friend. 
Thanks. I'm pleased to be on. It was it was really fun to interact tonight. It's a good way to come back. Oh yeah. That over six. TV. I'm Randy Loggins. This is the return of Off Planet TV after, um, I guess, about a two-month hiatus. And uh, I'm actually kind of glad to be back. I am very gratified by people who have inquired about the show and asked how I was doing. I'm doing fine. I just simply needed to do the introspective thing and step away for a little while and get a grip on what it was that we're doing in the alternative media. Um, over the last few months, I've, ass- I've assessed the landscape of alternative media, and I have been alternately amused, befuddled, and disgusted by what I've seen in the outreaches of the so-called alternative media, a term I don't like. I don't have a substitute for it, but maybe the person who is sitting with me tonight can help us find a way to rename this. We are not the alternative. They altered media. We're simply the ones who stepped into the fray and became, well, citizen journalists. Would that be a good way to put it? Maybe not. But I want to introduce, for those who do not know, my guest on this show tonight, which is basically part two of what we just did in the previous hour, Mr. Roger Landry, who is the publisher and founder of the LibertyBeacon.com. Roger, welcome to this side of the fence, brother. <laughs> I, you know what? I, I, I think that that is that that's something I'm going to have to think about. Okay, um, are we? Are we? Is this retrograde media? Retro- are we looking to bring bring it back to a day when we knew? That if a president did something stupid, Dan Rather couldn't wait to make him look stupid at six o'clock on the news. <clears throat> Do we hearken back to the day <clears throat> where a president, okay, listens to a couple of minutes of a tape and ends up by being forced out of the presidency, never mind a presidential candidate who deleted tens of thousands of top secret, um, you know, communiques off of her email server and is running for president. Come on. Are you trying to tell me that the way it was told back then ain't any different than the way it's being told today? I kind of like the term retrograde media. The only thing that wouldn't be too healthy with that is it would be associated with us and our failings. And anybody out there who believes that just because we know more, we've seen more, we've seen three generations of perspective, us baby boomers, that we're any better than those in front of us who are ignorant, who have been dumbed down, we're not because we have failed them. So, yeah, Randy, it's time to end the silence. And in my case, I don't know if I could actually talk more than I do. But in your case, I think there's a lot of room for you to talk more. (laughs) I wonder about that sometimes. Like I said, you know, when I stepped away 
those who follow me on Facebook know I posted something and I said, I'm going away for a while. And the reason for this is because of what I saw going on in the background of, of this media engine that is the internet. I saw that we were becoming exactly like the very thing we had started out to counter. I saw the people who were the strivers and the competitors and the backstabbers, the people who were the posers, the people who put, advanced their own ego and their own pocketbooks in favor of the truth that they wanted to ignore. I watched as talk show hosts turned into literally actors. And in some cases, actors became talk show hosts on the Internet and superstars at that. And I watched as hip businessmen ran bigger and bigger conferences, putting out the same names with the same tired themes. And none of it had a lot to do with the man in the street who was simply trying to deal with the cognitive dissonance of everyday life. And I had started out doing this show largely to expose things that at the time, nine years ago, not all that many people were talking about at the level that I wanted to expose it. I wanted to go after the black operations, the, um, the mind control programs, yes, the UFOs, yes, the extraterrestrial topics, and the paranormal and the psychoparanormal and all of the other things that sit in the margins of reality that don't get covered by the mainstream. Now all those things are mainstream. Um, and in some ways, I'm grateful. I'm grateful that the History Channel has done some of the things it's done on the UFO subject. I'm not so happy with the way they've done it. I'm not so happy with the organizations attendant in these so-called paranormal regions who have simply become, again, just another business at the end of the day. And so I stepped away for a while to assess it and see if it was reasonable to continue or if I had to become that which I had decided not to be in order to continue doing this. And I'm not going to throw my standards on the table for anybody to pick up like so many marbles. In the, as a result of doing this, I think what I learned was the value of alternative media or um, what, to, what, what did you just call it, Roger? Um, Retrograde retro, media. We'll call it retro media. Yes. Actual, you know, actually even the term media disturbs me because it's something that sits between you, the listener, the watcher, and information. Somehow along the way, journalists became the wall between those who held very valued information and those who required that information. The era of the newsman like Horace Greeley, the era of the newsman in the early 20th century, um, the Walter Winchells, the... Uh, oh, God, yes. The, the, the people who wrote... Genuine journalism, the standards that we sort of, for those who don't know, the last hour, if you're just catching this, what you need to do is then catch the previous hour, and you will know what Roger and I were talking about, this generation, the baby boomer generation, being the generation which now possess the largest perspective on history and altered history. We've lived, we've lived through the alteration of history. We lived through the rewriting of World War II. We lived through the rewriting of the JFK assassination. We lived through all of those assassinations that were thrown under the, under the carpet. We've lived through, what, a, a very rapid attempt to uh, basically soft soap 9-11 and every false flag incident that has occurred since 9-11 I mean, they just kept rolling them out and rolling them out in, in rapid profusion. And, you know, I said maybe about five years ago that I had gotten so, so jaded about these false flags that I no longer bothered to cover them. I used to deconstruct them right up to Sandy Hook. And when I saw what they did at Sandy Hook, I went, okay, that's it. I understand what they're doing now. And I thought that a lot of other people understood it as well. Then we get to this election cycle. And all of a sudden, I realize, you know, something, the alternative media, the, 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 whatever these people are out there, 
Can I name a couple of names? Can we just talk for a minute about Alex Jones, please? <laughs> Somebody needs to bring this dick up. Alex oh, Jones. Okay, all right. That's a picture I don't want in my mind. That's fine. <laughs> I don't either. But, okay, but anyway, go ahead. Okay, just for an example, Alex Jones is now the biggest cheerleader for Donald Trump. He has managed to find all of the reasons why the very people who should not ever be voting based on what they already know about this system should go to the polls and vote for Donald Trump because Roger Stone wrote a book exposing the Bush family and Roger Stone is exposing the Clintons. And Roger Stone says that he's an insider to the Trump campaign and that Donald Trump is straight up. Well, I want to call bullshit on that with Alex Jones and all you other talk show hosts out there who think it's okay to tell people they need to run out to the polls and vote for Donald Trump because I got news for you. They are about to pull the biggest false flag of all with Donald Trump. <laughs> well, you can't stop there. Well, let's What's just look at flag? it. Let's, let's, let's talk about Trump for a minute, and I don't want to. I know where you're going. You just stop to you just give a little bit more and then I'll pick the football up. I promise. People you, say, you, you say uh, false flag. All right. Let me set this up for you. You say false flag. I understand exactly what you mean. I call him a Trojan horse. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> I honestly believe <clears throat> that this is um, a smoke and mirrors situation. Don't look at this hand. Look what's going on in this hand. Okay. And let this be where your focus is. I honestly believe that not even Trump could possibly believe that he's qualified to run this country. And if he does, well, let's just ask ourselves real quickly, how good a job did he actually do? Let me see. He ran a company for how many years? How many times did this guy go bankrupt? Yeah. Gee, I think it was four. Um, and how many other things have happened along the way, which if he hadn't had the right people in the right places to bail his um, silver line butt out, he wouldn't be Trump today or he wouldn't be trumping anything today. So when you say false flag, inch that forward just a little bit more because there's some things that I want to say, but I need that lead in. Well, we have to ask ourselves who this guy really is. Is yes. he this is he this archetypal businessman? And, and I've gone through this. I've studied this. You know, in some respects, for those who remember the hero of um, a book called The Fountainhead written by Ayn Rand, you would remember the archetypal figure that was the builder. The man who built buildings and then ultimately decided to blow up his own buildings. Well, in a sense, I think what Trump represents is the false sense of this great hero, this great so-called capitalist. But what people don't realize is that Trump is and has always been a front man for other people and a consummate showman and very little of substance in between all of that. Well, wait a minute. Hold on, hold on, wait a minute. You just described just about every president in the history of the United exactly, States. Exactly, exactly. Okay, <clears throat> so, again, nothing too far outside of the box there. All right, <clears throat> has anybody even taken a look at which side of what type of issues this guy comes down on? This is a progressive and a half. This is an uber liberal. This is a guy who says America should be first, but not if it means he's got to come in last. This is a guy who has walked around touting, okay, <clears throat> this free enterprise system all over the place as look at what made me great, when in fact, nothing could be further from the truth. OK, this guy has been bankrupt. This guy has walked into minefields, this guy. And the only thing that has saved him is, yeah, he's a great showman. And there are people who wish to keep him around because guess what? His play isn't over yet. He's still got a few more scenes to play. And that is the reason that Trump is on stage today. Is he the consummate? You couldn't have put it better. This guy is the consummate distractor. He's not a great 
personality. He's not a super intelligent personality. Brilliant things don't come out of his mouth. But everything he says drags your attention, kicking and screaming from your face. Because that's who he is. He says outrageous things that anybody else who was running for president would probably lose 20 points. He gained 25 points for saying it because he has the audacity to say it. This guy is the consummate distraction. This guy is an uber liberal. If you look at what he wants to do, it is so akin to what the only female running for president, and I don't want to mention her name, is trying to do. They're playing from the same book. His money has gone to supporting people like the Clintons and Democrats for decades, tens of millions of dollars of it. Nobody, I think, is, well, maybe some are, but he's one of the largest supporters of the Clinton Foundation, and so on and so forth. The game with him is just starting. If this society is stupid enough to elect him as president, what you're going to find out is that – and God, I, 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 I hate to even have to say this. What you're going to find out is that Hillary would have been better, and I can't stand Hillary. I think it's worse than that. I think that given the trajectory of the con- country right now, Given the fact that we are almost certainly going into the sinking of the U.S. economy, we're already off of the mark as the as the international exchange medium. The dollar is about to be usurped. It's probably going to be gasping. Petrodollar is sinking. Yep. What better resume do you need? To be the president, the chief executive officer of the corporation masquerading as the government of the United States of America, <laughs> the man who has presided over bankrupt countries and used his political capital to weasel his way into situations where he really doesn't even have the acumen to operate. I can tell you, and I said this on Chuck O'Shelley's show last week, Donald Trump is not a conservative. No. He's not a Republican. No. He is a neoliberal. Yes. And even more dangerously, he is an imposter as a businessman. Yes. Um, the idea that we need a businessman to run this country. You asked, you said her earlier, who's qualified to run America? And the answer lies in the thing we were talking about in the last hour of the show, Roger. And it has to do with responsibility. The fact of the matter is right now, The American people are supposed to be running this country, not some CEO, not some board of directors, not a bicameral Congress, which is completely illegal and outlawed and has been since 1861. The American people, if they understood who they were and they understood their power and they stood in that power, would appoint somebody righteous into the office to affect the things that need to be done at the executive level of government, but he would not be seen as the hood ornament on this current version of government, which is what round of government reformation are we into now? This country has been bankrupt three times. It's bankrupt again. It's about to see its primacy as the economic force and engine of the world eclipsed by the merger of China, Russia, India, the BRICS Consortium, and a mass exodus that's going to occur as the EU collapses and as NATO itself goes into decline. The person who needs to run this country now would be the person wise enough to look the American people in the eye and tell them what you and I told them last hour, and I'll say it now. You have been derelict in your duty. You have been ignorant of who you are. You have horrendously shredded the precious freedoms that you were given, which are inherent to your being, which have nothing to do with a piece of paper, nothing to do with the Constitution, nothing to do with voting or licenses or laws or anything else but your moral integrity to be self 
governing, which means that you now have to have a moral standing on which to operate. Well, I have Feel free to, to disagree if you if you don't. Uh, well, how the hell could I possibly disagree with that? I just want to take it a little bit further. Um, I want to we I I've, I've written several articles on this topic because nothing really pisses me off more than this. And, um, <laughs> let me start off by saying it this way, okay? We are the architects of our own demise. We are responsible for everything we suffer. We are personally responsible for everything we suffer as a society. Anybody who blames this government is blaming men for doing what men do when put into these situations over and over and over again throughout 10,000 years of recorded history. Some of it not so well recorded, but the one thing we always knew was that a government left to its own devices, will eventually accumulate power and wealth unto themselves to the detriment of those they govern. This is what we are seeing today. So for anybody out there saying, well, we put somebody in there who doesn't have any money. No. Because, again, (coughs) what you're looking at is an entire spectrum of ignorance. Okay. If you've never had money, um, then there's a whole bunch of things you don't know. I have nothing against people who have money. I really don't. What I have against is we live in a society whereby everything is free trade. Okay. It's all free trade. Okay. It's supposed to be. And what we're looking at is a system that is so rigged, so locked up, so entrusted to trust, trusts. That and all of this is illegal. So we're looking at a situation today where the government overtaxes those who might become a burden on their friends um, uh, and and the lobbyists that are supporting them. Um, And anybody who doesn't have enough money goes away. I I hear people in Europe railing against capitalism and the, the destruction of America was capitalism when nothing could be further from the truth. Because if you are stupid enough to look at what's going on in this country and call it capitalism, you're a freaking idiot. And I won't apologize for that. Nothing that is going on in this country today, the the destruction of the dollar, the destruction of the economy, the destruction of the manufacturing base, none of this is capitalism. None of this. We don't live in a, in, in, in a democratically ruled republic anymore, do we? No, we live in an oligarchy. Well, what the hell makes you think an oligarchy is going to allow us to live in capitalism? Have I got this wrong, Randy? It's not just the democracy that's gone. Okay? It's everything. The monetary system, everything that built this, that, that, that made this country powerful has been usurped everything sucked away like a leech over the last two generations at least what made the country great what makes a people great isn't even capitalism it's enterprise yes capitalism was really an invention as well it was much like marxism it was masterminded the wealth of nations by adam smith was a manifesto which basically connected the concept of material wealth to the concept of nation states. Yep. The nation itself has no riches because the nation itself is the people who populate the nation, who animate it, who do the work. What made America great, what made Europe great, was enterprise. It was people who worked, people who invented, people who dreamed, people who created, artists, scientists, Great inventors, people with vision, people with the stamina to do something dramatic and different and beautiful and to create something. And to do it with an eye towards a long-term plan that when generations passed, they're in life. Well, this is exactly what I'm talking about, and I'm glad you ran into this, because basically what I said was, you know, 
you can't blame people. Um, you can't blame capitalism. You can't blame democracy. You can't no. blame – because these are not the catalysts. The catalysts are – and I just got done basically screaming to everybody, um, if you don't think this is your fault, you're an idiot. Well, let me explain that just a little bit, okay? In a constitutional – republic the people are the sovereigns the least powerful rung on the ladder of power or authority is the federal government they have the least amount of enumerated powers they're almost impudent okay in the face of the states or in the face of the sovereigns they are but yet today we look at an all powerful government that now decides to rig the game in their friend's favor and not in your favor. So when you and I were young or even before that, the turn of the 20th century and these people were having phenomenal ideas and starting new companies and rivaling the big older companies and making their mark in the world, try and do that today. Because if you're stepping on Microsoft's footprint, or if you're stepping on Google, or if you're stepping on um, IBM, or if you're stepping on any one of these oligarchal, I don't know, monoliths today, you're not going to survive. It's not going to happen. The system is rigged against you. So anybody out there who thinks that we need to change our politics, we need to step up to the plate and take responsibility for our own rights and freedoms, you're absolutely right. But if you don't for one second imagine that none of this had to happen if we hadn't let it happen, none of it. All of the tyranny we face today was built one small brick set on top of another. And one small brick from 100 feet away don't look like it can do crap. It doesn't scare you. It doesn't make you, I don't know, sweat. It doesn't, you know, bring chills out. It's just one little tiny brick sitting there. But over 100 years with tens of hundreds of thousands of bricks laying, now we see a wall standing in front of us that isn't about freedom that isn't about capitalism, that isn't about a constitutional republic. It's about the tyranny that we literally watch that wall get built. Have I got it right, Randy? We are the, we are the beneficiaries of a very long arc in what has occurred in this country. It goes back to the seeds of this country, but certainly... In our lifetime, we have seen all of it come home to roost. All of it completely created on illusions of emergencies. Because yes. now, every time they want another level of control, we have another emergency. Absolutely. Um, you want to you want to install one world government, a new world order, an Illuminati state? You do a nine eleven, and guess what? They have the technology to do it. You you want you want to create a brain dead, sick, putrefying corpse of a populace. You put planes in the air, and you fuel them up with this substance that oozes and seeps all over the sky. And then you use your media to lie to them and tell them, "Oh no, those those are just contrails. Those are just the natural things that come out of the exhaust of plates." And then you hand people this. And you, you get them and trained to walk around with this in front of their face like this, never looking up, never looking sideways, completely addicted to digital media, completely unaware of anything going on around them, ossifying their, their, their state of, of beingness and, and drawing it down to a point five and a half inches long and three and a half inches wide screen. That's how you do it. And but if have you have no awareness. If you can cram all the entertainment I want <clears throat> into something, into a window that small for my consciousness and keep it focused down on it as obviously effectively as they have learned to do, then what <clears throat> we basically set up is exactly what I just finished describing to you. Yeah. The scenario whereby we willingly sit back and watch all of the bricks being put in place that wall that walls us off from our rights, from our freedoms, from our uh, ability to build a business and have it successful. All of these things, we literally have watched this 
happen. Now, what should be surprising everybody here is that usually it is the oldest generation looking back on the two younger generations telling you guys how you screwed up. What Randy and I are doing is we're telling you guys how we screwed, we screwed up, up and the terrible scenario we left you to fall into. You literally didn't have any choice because we allowed the mechanisms to be put into place that sealed your doom. So now it is that much more difficult for Randy and I to have a conversation with you to bring you back into the light, so to speak. To have the light come on in your eyes that tells us you're finally starting to understand how this is all connected. Because if you think that vaccines ain't connected to GMOs, ain't connected to fluoride, ain't connected to geoengineering, ain't connected to perpetual warfare, ain't connected to political tyranny, you're an idiot. It all comes from the very same starting point. We just get the pieces we, that, that people feel we need as we need them. We are not sitting here telling you how bad you guys all screwed up. We're telling you how bad we screwed up. And it is up to us, the baby boomers, the 60 to 75-year-olds, the ones who have those invaluable years of um, perception. We need to apologize to you, and we need to redouble our efforts to show you that all is not lost, and there's actually some good things going on out there. There's some successes. Everything isn't doom and gloom. Coming from me, boy, you might have just about had a heart attack on that one, but I truly, <laughs> truly believe it, and I do know of a lot of positive things, but Randy, you chuckled at that because it's the truth. Far too many people in your position and mine, and I don't put you and I in, in that exact characterization because I don't think we fit, um, uh, are what we call fear porn today. Um, I'm going to get you addicted to getting your crap scared out of you every time you listen to me, so you're going to come to me every day to get your the- crap scared out of you at least once. That right? was one of my that was one of my issues with doing media in this in this platform is the too amount easy. of fear porn that's out there. It's too the easy. The amount of sewing into it. Okay, so let's back this up a little bit. You and I came to this show tonight. You put an article out. Uh, we'll post a link with this later. But the original theme was actually the name of one of the Liberty Beacon websites, the Falling Darkness. Yep. And it is a two-edged sword, and we talked about it. As you described it to me, it is the falling darkness. The darkness is falling. But it is also the darkness is falling. Those two things sitting side by side are two perspectives on the same set of words. The darkness has fallen, and the darkness is falling. There is light right now. There is something in humanity, because humanity has been on this planet for a long time, probably far longer than the average person imagines. And we have been through five (coughs) extinction-level cycles on this planet recorded historically, and yet we are still here breathing and breathing and, and doing what we do. And there is a pivot in history. There is a decision point in history. We're living in it now. It pivots on this generation and the generations that came from us. We were the dawn of the age of Aquarius. Yes, that song had some truth to it. Yes. Now, what we did with it was we squandered it for 40 some odd years while we pursued material things and pursued carnal pleasures, and pursued the decay of a world, and deferred our responsibility off to proxies like politicians and priests and all these other classes of of oligarchs. But we don't have to do that anymore. We can begin to walk in the light that exists on this planet, because there is a light. And the darkness will fall when we make right decisions and when we make conscious decisions to not engage this darkness any further. The decisions are small as you go through them. They are decisions that we make collectively as a race. 
and individually as human beings each day. They are the decisions you make, how you interact with people, how you conduct your business, how you conduct conversations, the things that you indulge in, the things you create, the things you destroy, all of this are the small decision points of how this thing's going to go. I'm not a fatalist. I don't believe in the dark prophecies anymore. I believe we are at a decision point. And I think collectively and individually each day, we make decisions that will contribute in totality to how this planet's going to go and how this race is going to be, let's say, matriculated into the next stage. Well, we... When when I came up with the name for the website, The Falling Darkness, th- those are the first two things that hit me, um, is that this is <clears> – <throat> this has a very blatant double meaning, okay? Either things are getting so much more evil by the day that the fall- darkness is falling all around us. We're suffocating in it. Or we have become so aware of what is being perpetrated and perpetuated on us – that we're starting to see the rays of sun from behind the clouds of, of tyranny. Yeah. So the darkness is falling away from us. One of the biggest questions I have when people um, send me messages on the falling darkness is how do you see the title? Because when you tell me how you perceive the name, then I can tell you why maybe what you're feeling or the comment you're making about a a particular article is maybe not on target. So it, but if you stop and consider, those are the the decisions we have today. These are the decisions we have today, but they're both applicable. We want both to happen. Okay. We want the darkness to fall around us so we can establish who is that darkness. Then we want it to continue to pass and fall away from us so that we know where to focus on those we need to educate. And that's what this all comes down to, people. This isn't about money. This is about education. All right? This isn't about power. This is about education. This isn't about fame and fortune. This is about education. I got to tell you something. If we can't or we don't take the time, to impart the knowledge we have on our children and our children's children, one generation and two generations back from us, Randy, us baby boomers. If we don't take the time, the world you will see no more than 25 years from now will be a population that is minuscule compared to what you see today. That will be a planet where slavery is the rule, not the exception. And where the only people who are free are the people who feel that by the right of birth or by the amount of money their ancestors put together, put away in some vault somewhere, they have the right to enjoy life where you have only the right to serve them in any capacity they see fit. We are at that crossroads, Randy, and I don't think you could have put it any better. We sit on the precipice right now. Of a whole new humanity, if humanity wakes up and says, we're the boss, not you, or we're looking at the fruition of the predictions on the Georgia Guidestones, okay, 500 million people living Mm -hmm. on the planet, 10,000 of them ruling the world, the other close to 500,000 doing everything they need or wish us to do. This ain't a joke. This ain't a joke. No, this is a design of these very self-same oligarchs. Why is the United States have the fastest rising level of infertility on the planet? Why were there, was there a 318,000 birth deficit last year in the United States? Did you hear what I said? 318,000. All right. We're not only the sickest nation on the planet. We are soon to be the highest level of infertility on the planet and we have the highest level of chronic illness in the world and anybody who knows anything about chronic illness is most people who are chronically ill don't procreate so we get you terminally sick or we get you so sick that you're you're going to be 
wish you were terminal all of your life, or we make you infertile, or you end up with a cognitive dysfunction that puts you in some sort of care for the rest of your life. How many of these are going to procreate, Randy? What you're looking at in the next decade is a drop off of population. We're going to pass through zero population growth very soon in this country, and it's going to shock the hell out of the world. Well, if you just look at all of the tiny little things that they're doing, for instance, just even the leaching xenoestrogen in plastic bottles and plastic. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay? We're not only being <laughs> empathized and, and infertile, but we're being altered hormonally. Girls will be boys and boys will be girls, sang the kinks low those many years ago. Now, I'm not making moral judgments here. I'm saying that once your hormonal system is screwed up, not only do you have an identity issue, you have hormonal problems that lead to very, very huge health problems. Uh, attempting to tinker with the hormonal system of human beings is just this shy of genetic altering them. And in fact, it actually goes to genetic alteration as well. Well, well you, you, you know what horizontal gene transfer is, right? Sure. Yeah. That's where you consume the genes of another um, living entity, whether it was a plant, an animal, whatever. And we're and doing that they, too. Right. And they can, scientifically proven over and over again, have some impact on your genetic structure. Now, if you're looking at um, GMOs as I look at them and, and the massive research I've done in them and things like um, uh, Agent Orange and things, which, again, is being used as a, believe it or not, a herbicide. And, yeah, Agent Orange, um, its main component. Also, glyphosate. If you're looking at these things, not only do they cause sterility, fact, not only do they cause, um, uh, are they known carcinogens, fact, okay, but we are lied to on a daily basis. We're told that there's so little of this glyphosate in things, and it only has this specific toxin level, and it's so small that it's never going to bother you. All right, but they're right. They're telling you the truth. See, the biggest lies are half truths mm -hmm. because what that is a fact. Glyphosate only has a specific toxin level, and if in small enough, um, you know, um, doses, is it really all that harmful? What they don't tell you is they take the glyphosate and put it in the Roundup bottle with the label on it, which has maybe 50 or 60 inner components in it that are added to the glyphosate to help it do its job, its job better. Those inner components raise the lethality, the cancer-causing ability of glyphosate a thousand percent. But you're never told that, ever. So why do so many of us have cancer today? Why do so many of us have brain diseases today? Why are so many of us infertile today? Why is America the leaders in all of this? Let me tell you what you're number one at. Let me tell you real quick, okay? We are involved in the most wars of any nation on this planet today. We are the most GMO'd. We are the most geoengineered. We are the most vaccinated. We are the most drugged. We are the most fluoridated. We are the most overextended financially, and we are the most geoengineered society on the planet. Every damn thing that can screw you up royally, America is in the bullseye, the crosshairs. We are exposed to it at a higher level than anybody on the planet. Why has America gone from the healthiest to the sickest nation on the planet in less than three generations? If you don't know, Maybe it's too late for you. All right, Randy, did I miss anything in the we're number ones? No, that was the tour de force. You you really, yeah. you know, you really, you really nailed it. Well, it's it's up to people like you and I right now to do exactly what we're doing here, to let our children and our children's children know where we failed them and what we can do to help them play catch up pretty damn quick. 
I know a lot of people were going to say, but that Roger, he screams too much. Well, I do. <laughs> there has to be a voice. There, there, there has to be sound. There has to be fury. There has to be passion in all of this. I don't have that gift to do what Roger does. I have my own style and my own way of doing things. But I think we've all done this long enough now. We've all kind of huddled around this campfire, saying kumbaya, and talked about all the woo-woo things, but we haven't dealt with the reality, which is that we've allowed this to happen on our watch. And now we got to stop it. And there are good things. And I, yes. I want to say this while you're on the show tonight. In the time that I've been associated with the Liberty Beacon, which is coming up, I guess, almost two years or so, maybe a little yep. longer. Yep. It's been my privilege to meet people that are passionate like Roger. It's been my privilege to meet people who write articles every day, who are out there papering the airwaves with a thousand podcasts, a million blogs, YouTube videos. They're activists. They go out into the streets. They go and meet people who have problems. They're dealing with the vaccines. They're dealing with autistic children. They're dealing with parents who are at the end of their life, and they're dealing with senility. They're dealing with death, and yet they're optimists because they're optimistic enough to advance themselves into a cause and be passionate about it. Now, in that spectrum is where you, the listener, come in. What are you passionate about? What do you care about? What do you love? What do you hate? And what pisses you off? <laughs> all of that, all of that, there's a place for you to do the same thing. See, activism isn't about a talk show host, a TV show host, a blogger, or a YouTuber. And you don't need a license. You don't need a license. <laughs> the FCC ain't controlling us. For however long we have to do this, we're going to put it out. And we're going to keep putting it out because guess what? The same message repeated over and over and over again has the same hypnotic effect as their advertising from Madison Avenue has had. And what we're selling you is something that's going to preserve your life, not just give you a pearly white smile and, and a nice sheeny set of hair. <laughs> about you uh, ending your life and making the lives of the next generation better. So the product we're selling here is humanity and a humanity that wakes up and then stays awake and stays vigilant. You can't vote your way into a better future, folks. You can't buy your way into it because your money's worthless. Your government is bankrupt. It's morally bankrupt. I can say that. Your leaders, so-called, are not leaders. They are simply little wind-up toys that are trotted on the TV screens to hypnotize you into thinking that you don't have any power. You have the power you need to pick this thing up and make it work again. Whether it is in the area of law or technology or the arts or media or whatever you decide to aspire to, you pick it up and you start to play with it and you have fun with it. But at the same time, you maintain your passion and serious focus on what lies ahead because what lies ahead is the collision that's coming here in America. And that is going to be a tidal wave out into the rest of the world unless we take control of this beast now. That's the next show that you and I will combine somewhere down the road, maybe a month or so. Um, that is the next discussion I foresee you and I having. <clears throat> Where we, what we accomplished tonight was to tell everybody, <clears throat> nobody here is blameless. Nobody. But we suffer more blame than we are willing to tell most people. What people need to understand is that as a as a generation, this generation knows more because we've lived through more. We know the changes. We've seen the changes. We know what we started with. We know what we ended up with. But at the same time, we failed to do the one thing that was our task. Are our leaders doing what we expect them to do? Absolutely. Are they doing it exactly like most human beings would do over the course of history? Exactly. Who's the only people here who have failed miserably at our component? What we should be doing 
to break, keep this republic a viable entity. That is us, my friends. We are the biggest failure. We are the cause of all we suffer. Let's make today the point where we start to change that. And we start that by educating our children and our children's children. I want to thank you for letting me be here, Randy. Always have, um, always have such a good time talking with you because you don't beat me up over being politically correct, which is something I freaking hate. <laughs> I hate but, it. Well, politically correct's just that's fascism. That's just another way for people to do mind control on you, and we're not going to do that here. And stick yeah. me in a box somewhere where I don't fit. <clears throat> Exactly. You know, I, I look, my listeners know me. I'm transparent. I communicate with them. They may not like what I say. I may piss them off. And some of them don't talk to me anymore. Yeah, but, but you, you don't call them idiots. Lying to them. <laughs> well, sometimes I do. Uh, <laughs> there's for I mean, you know? I, I, I have no, and, and for anybody who believes that any of this emotional outbursts are staged, they're absolutely not. No. Randy, uh, Randy can tell you. I yeah, am no, I've talked to this man for <laughs> years. You know, yeah. we, and anybody that knows Roger and I knows that sometimes Roger and I go head to head. And okay. it's all done in a spirit of, I will just say, brotherly love, because that's really what we do. Exactly. Um, iron sharpens iron, said some ancient writings. Yes. Well, uh, we got a lot of iron to sharpen out there, folks, and um, you're part of it. This is not a passive relationship. No. Something. Roger, I want to thank you for coming on. Let people know about the Liberty Beacon. We got a little bit of time here where they can find it and what they can expect. Well, we've got the Liberty Beacon. That was the very first of uh, all of the websites that came into the project. That's the flagship site. And then the Falling Darkness. Um, we've got Middle East Rising. We've got Go Forward Together. We've got uh, the Town Crier. <clears throat> and we have a bunch of partner sites who basically sign up for our news feed. Um, so we're looking at at least a couple of dozen websites globally. We're looking at a boutique radio network and a weekly television show. Gee, you're watching that today. And Randy is the guy who's helping us to develop the Liberty Beacon Project, this media um, behemoth that we're trying to turn this into. And Randy, we got some big things going on in the future, don't we? And I'm very, very excited that you're, you're spending very the time. Excited. Yeah, it's going to be an exciting year. It's going to be a great year. It's uh, been great being back live tonight. I want to thank uh, Biggie and Mel over at Conscious Consumer Network. Don't forget to support free and independent media. I'm Randy Moggins. My website is offplanetradio.com. And if you go over there, there's huge archive of things that you can partake of. We'll be back with another show real soon. As I always like to say, the truth is out there. It's inside you. Now go find it and do something with it. Namaste. <laughs> <laughs>